Hey, well, it is hot. And look at me. Here I am on the oxygen again. I'll be honest with you. I have been on oxygen now for, um, well, two or three months, almost 24-7. Um, there were days maybe uh, more than a month ago when I could go portions of the day without it. Um, when I'm out and about driving, for instance, there were, on most occasions, I was able to go without the oxygen. Uh, there were times when, you know, during the day, particularly in the afternoon, I tend to wear it longer in the morning, uh, that I could take it off, you know, as I was sitting on the couch or watching TV. But um, once I get up on my feet, of course, I always had to put it on if I was going anywhere very far because I can't walk much distance at all um, before my oxygen drops. Um, but lately, like I said, these last two or three months, there was a significant drop in my oxygen level, um, you know, without oxygen, uh, shortly after Halloween. And um, and in the last, I'm going to say the last uh, 60 days or so, um, I had another setback and, you know, another little bout of infection or congestion or whatever that um, to this day really has not completely gone away. And so I'm finding that if I take my oxygen off, even, you know, for five minutes or whatever, my oxygen drops to, like, really borderline territory. Um, to qualify for oxygen, they set you walking on, a, like, a couple of minutes, six minutes, I don't know what it is, and they measure your, you know, the, um, uh, the oxygen content in your blood. And it has to dip down to, like, I don't know, I think it's 88% oxygen in your blood before um, you don't wear below. Um, so even if you're like at 90 or whatever, eh, you don't quite qualify. It's got to, I think, below be below like 89. Uh, I'm not exactly certain of that, but I, I, I'm real close. Um, at any rate, so I qualified for oxygen long ago because if I start walking without oxygen, it usually doesn't take me too long. Um, before my oxygen level drops, particularly if I walk at a at a normal pace, you know, like most people would walk. Um, in my case, like last year, the year before, whatever, there was a time when I could walk at about one mile per hour, um, and sustain that almost indefinitely without requiring oxygen. Um, but the minute I went up to like, let's say. 1.5 mile an hour or you know 2 mile an hour um, the oxygen level would start dropping right away so all I had to do was walk at a normal pace and within you know a minute or two my oxygen level would drop you know well below you know the required 88 89 level and so that's how I qualified for oxygen but the truth was you know that you know was several years back and um and even you know after that for most of the day I, I didn't wear oxygen i could walk from my house you know out to the driveway get in the car um i didn't really require oxygen unless i was walking like i say for you know at a at a faster pace you know for um for distance so i could even you know even a year or two ago I was able to go shopping, you know, I'd grab a shopping cart, I would walk 50 feet, you know, slow. Uh, as soon as I felt a little winded, I would stop wherever I was standing, wait to catch my breath, and proceed, you know. And so, you know, it wasn't like I was walking non-stop throughout the store, in which case my oxygen would have dropped. I can't do any of that now. Um, so I've been on oxygen, like I say, for the last, oh, I don't know, almost 60 days, probably nonstop. And I'm going to try to wean myself off it, but I'm going to have to do it gradually. The truth is, if you're wearing oxygen all the time, it becomes a self-fulfilling, um, you know, result that you're going to remain on oxygen because your, your lungs become not just dependent on the oxygen, you know, they, they become weakened from the uh, lack of the, you know, 
uh, uh, breathing on your own. So, anyway, so uh, I, I've been going back to rehab here lately. I took a hiatus from going to my pulmonary rehab, which is basically exercise classes. Uh, twice a week I go. I always go late in the afternoon. I'm kind of like their last appointment. And um, that way there's not very many people there. Usually when I go in, uh, there's like maybe one uh, physical therapist there, maybe one person in the office, if that. Um, uh, I'm there for an hour. There's you maybe one other patient that he's working with for maybe half of that time that I'm there. And, um, and so anyway, so I chose that time period because there was less risk to me, you know, with COVID and everything going around. Uh, this is the only medical facility that I've been in. And I trust me, I've been to many, um, with all of the procedures and things I've been going through. Um, this is the only one that, uh, medically affiliated facility that does not require masks. And so none of the therapists, none of the office staff, none of the patients um, are wearing masks there. Now, to be honest with you, um, I tend not to wear a mask there either. And that's because that it is really hard for me to be up on my feet or doing any type of physical exercise of any sort, um, even on oxygen, while wearing a mask. Now, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know what my lung function is right now, but last time it was tested, it was about 18.5%. I'm guessing it's less than that now because I've condition has worsened since I took that test like in uh, September or October. Um, all I know is that when I put on a mask, it's really hard for me to, I mean, I'm just gasping for breath. Um, I've got to sit still for three or four minutes catch my breath um, and then put the mask on and so it's hard like when you're entering a building and you've got to walk a certain distance with the mask on it's really hard for me um, this is why I don't do any of my own shopping anymore unless I'm on my scooter um, and I haven't even used that all winter because you know it's been winter uh, so anyway uh my condition is not where I'd like it to be. I'm going to try to wean myself gradually off of the oxygen by uh, taking this thing off. Um, you know, for whatever it is, 15 minutes, I'm going to monitor myself. Maybe I can go a half hour, gradually try to lengthen it so that each day maybe I'm going a couple of hours. And uh, eventually I want to get to the point where I'm off at most of the daytime. Now, of course, when I got to get up and walk around or, you know, uh, do anything at all physical, it's going to go on. But I'm saying that the more I can get off of it, probably the better off I'll be. Um, and I'm just hoping it's not too late for that. Um, so anyway, so those are some of the things that have been going on. I've still been going through my um, lung uh, transplant evaluation up at university hospitals. They had called everything off for a couple of months. One, because I had missed a couple of appointments. Uh, this was when COVID was raging over the winter and uh so i had missed a couple of things i did go in and get a colonoscopy i think i told you about a little over uh i don't know six weeks ago i think it was january 25th or something um and everything went you know well i guess uh you know i passed that um they called me earlier in the week and they told me that they've got me back on schedule now so i will be going in about three weeks from now to have the double heart catheter done they're going to go up through my leg up to the right side of my heart through um, an artery and they'll go through I don't know the neck or the arm on the left side and enter the, the heart from the left side um, not looking forward to that but that's got to be done and um, and then I don't know about two weeks after that uh, sometime in early May first week of May or so I got to go up there and there's a whole battery of things I've got to do one day uh, nothing to like, I know at some point they're going to do an endoscopy, which I'm not looking forward to that either. They shove a tube down your throat and enter your stomach and, I think, uh, part of your small intestine or whatever. And uh, I think they um, I think they use some type of anesthetic for that. Uh, but um, at any rate, that's not on the schedule yet. Uh, 
So first week of April, I'm going in. I think they're going to do some kind of scan and and a number of other meetings with doctors or whatever. But not exactly sure what the, what all is up with that. Um, so I'm glad to see that they're, you know, that they're um, proceeding. So far, I've been told that everything that I've uh, undergone, all of the scans, all of the tests, all of the, um, you know, medical procedures that they've done, you know, have me on track as being eligible. Um, so the heart catheter is going to be a real um, important, uh, you know, element in, in uh, or factor in, you know, in my eligibility, um, you know, to make sure that I don't have any, you know, chronic uh, heart issue. Now, I'm not aware of any, but the way I gasp for breath every time I move, I guess, you know, you never know. Uh, um, so I know that that's required, and I'm. Uh, well overdue to have that test done. Um, other than that, um, I went to the dentist uh, last week, and um, we put together a plan. Th uh, one of the things I have to do for this to remain eligible for a heart transplant or a lung transplant is, um, you know, I have to have a, you know, a dentist sign off on the fact that, you know, any um, um, what do they call it? periodontal disease or gum disease or infection or cavities or whatever have been addressed because all of those would be a major no-no on uh, getting me on the transplant list and uh and i've had you know a number of issues over the years you know with uh you know with you know my dental situation i've had a number of teeth removed i certainly don't have a full complement of teeth anymore um, I'm missing a couple of teeth right near the front, in fact. And um, so, you know, aside from the health aspect of it, I simply haven't had the money to address some of these things. I certainly can't. I don't think I'm a candidate for certain medical, for certain dental procedures like implants. Not that I could ever afford it. But um, truth is, I have suffered a lot of gum loss, a lot of bone loss, um, significantly because... I think of the amount of prednisone that I've been on now for, you know, number of years. Um, but also probably because of, a, you know, other infections that I've had. Uh, I haven't had any recently, but, uh, you know, prior to that, I, I did. And that was often because I would have a cavity. I would take a, um, I would take a um, antibiotic or whatever. And, um, and, you know, and the pain would go away and the, and I'd never go in and get the, uh, you know, the cause taken care of. Um, same thing, I'd get a gum infection or something because of something under the gum line or whatever. And a, a dentist would write me out an antibiotic and then I wouldn't go and get the, the deep cleaning or whatever that I required. So, I, you know, a lot of it's my fault. I didn't take care of myself. Um, uh, but who likes dentists, right? So anyway, so I went to the dentist and he looked at everything I had. And I thought, you know, this is it. They're going to give me dentures, right? Um, and uh, and to my surprise, he said, no, you know, we don't need to do that. Uh, uh, the teeth that I have, and like I said, I don't have a full complement, but uh, the teeth that I do have, I don't have any cavities at all. Um, the, the thing that I do have, however, is like I say, a couple of places where the gum line is, um, you know, shallower than it needs to be. So I have a couple of teeth that while the teeth are somewhat okay, um, too much of the root is exposed or uh, there's not enough, you know, not enough bone there. Uh, I think I've got one place where there's like 20% bone or, you know, up to 40% bone. Um, so while most of it is okay, there's one or two places where it's not. So I know they're going to remove at least one tooth because of that. I think they're debating on another one. So what his plan was was to do a series of... Um, cleanings. Now, I went in last week and had a, a, a cleaning. Uh, they want me to go back in uh, probably within the next week or so and have what they call a deep cleaning um, where they got to numb you up because they go under the gum line to, you know, to clear out whatever tartar might be um, below the gum line. And um, had that done years ago, uh, something you certainly don't want to go through without, um, without uh, Novocaine. At any rate, um, and then he was going to do, 
he had a plan for the top and the bottom and they involved some bridge work you know I don't know maybe a crown here or there and he presented me with this idea and it was going to be like $9,500 and so it didn't take me you know uh, more than you know 24 hours to kind of calculate that and say you know that's not going to fly I can't afford that um, now they do have financing options and my credit is believe it or not is fairly good because uh, you know thanks to the help I get I've been able to stay on top of the monthly bills so everything's paid on time but uh, the truth is my budget doesn't allow you know an extra $200 a month or whatever that would be $300 a month um, and especially knowing that I'm going to hopefully be going through a lung transplant where I'm going to have a considerable monthly outlay just on you know required medications I'll have to take and who knows what medical bills um, now I did change my insurance a little bit so that you know more would be covered but uh, uh, there are certain things I will still be responsible for and so I'm trying to figure out how I can get the dental work done so I told him you know I went back uh, a couple of days ago day before yesterday and I told him look we're going to have to uh, reduce this plan nine thousand nine thousand five hundred dollars is just not doable you know we've got to you know at least cut that in half you know so he reworked the plan and I don't know all of the details of it yet um, but it basically is going to do whatever is required on the bottom um, but uh, won't involve anything real expensive um, the top he will address with a bridge because like I say I'm missing like I don't know what this is a bicuspid over here and uh, I've got a couple of teeth in this thing over here which uh, you know so it's it's not just um, it, it's both a cosmetic um, issue but it's also has something to do with like you know my ability to eat and stuff so anyway so he's going to build like a bridge I think that is going to address a couple of teeth that are missing um, and uh and uh, and like I say, I'll have to live with uh, what's going on in the bottom, I guess. Um, anyway, so I understand it. Uh, the price for this is going to be around four thousand, forty-five hundred dollars or something. So I'm, I've been kind of racking my brain here the last couple of days trying to figure out, you know, can I afford to do that? Um, and uh, I think I can swing it without too much. Of an issue. I'm going to try to keep it, you know, to like a, a two-year plan, two-year uh, uh, loan. I'm going to try to put something down, and um, and uh, and so we'll see. But um, uh, at any rate, I'll go back and um, I need a little bit more detail of what exactly he's doing, what exactly I'm paying for, and what and what are my other cheaper options. Um, so that's coming up. The other thing that was significant, I've gotten out of the house and done a few things this week. Uh, going to the dentist, obviously, is one of them. Um, going to rehab has been another one. But uh, the other thing I've done is I finally got around. You know, I've been um, I've been uh, holding on to my both my mom and my dad's um, ashes. Both my parents... Um, were cremated when they passed away my dad in 2007 my mom um, on her birthday in August of 2013 and um, neither of them had enough insurance to um, cover the cost of you know their burial um, so we were able to cover you know like the cremation process the you know the, the funeral arrangements or whatever but uh, so their ashes have been kind of um, held a, you know, a place of, uh, of honor, if you will, you know, uh, on the shelf here, um, in my house. And, um, some time ago I'd saved up enough money for their cemetery plots, but I've held off on actually paying for and, um, and having them, you know, actually interred. Um, so I went down to the, um, to the uh, there's two cemeteries here in town one 
is uh, the the main cemetery here for for that most folks have uh, used. There's another one that's actually much more expensive, as it turns out, uh, that is um, through the Catholic Church. So the Catholics, uh, the Catholic Church has its own cemetery, even though it's it's actually located right in the smack dab in the middle of a residential neighborhood, n not anywhere really near the, the church or any other, you know, um, commercial or industrial area. But um, at any rate, so I was going to have my parents interred at the, the regular um, uh, cemetery here in town um, because that's where most of their friends, you know, have been um, buried or will be. And uh, that's... Um, kind of what they, you know, wanted. So um, I went down there this week and I paid for their interment. I think it was like $525 each. Um, and so it came to like $1,050 altogether. And, um, you know, and I'd been saving up for that. And um, that had kind of been put away uh, for some time. And uh, so I didn't want to do it over the winter, you know, and I still haven't picked out an exact date. Um, I've got to um, call, you know, like I said, I don't have any immediate family left now that my brother passed away uh, two years ago. Um, but, um, uh, you know, there's his family. Um, I do have some cousins. Uh, many of whom were, you know, close to my brother and uh, or my mom and dad. And um, so I'm going to contact, you know, a number of them and and see, you know, if anybody has any interest at all in um, in being there. I don't really plan on having any kind of a ceremony at all. I want to be there, and so I need it to be a day that's warm enough and nice enough for me to be outside for a little while. Um, so I'm figuring I'm going to schedule it for sometime in late April, um, early May at the latest. And um, But I feel good that at least that's being taken care of now. The other thing that I need to do is I need to consult an attorney. Um, I have a name someone recommended to me because I don't really have, you know, an attorney um, <laughs> on call. Um, but uh, someone that specializes in, like, estate planning or whatever, uh, you know, if something should happen to me, and something might, um, you know, uh, I don't have anybody to hand the house down to. And um, if I were to hand it over to my sister-in-law and my niece, uh, my understanding is they would probably lose it right away. Um, the way the house is set up is there's still a mortgage that's still in my parents' name. And so when my mom passed away, the deed was set up so that the house was in my name and my mom was what they called um, a holder of a life estate, and um, which basically meant that she had certain rights of living in the house um, and couldn't be, you know, like removed, um, you know, because I didn't want her here or something. Um, but when she passed, you know, in 2013, the mortgage was still in her name uh, because the loan was taken out, you know, by my mom and dad. And um, the trouble was, on my income at that time, what I probably should have done, you know, was to have her name removed from the, you know, uh, from the deed so that it was just my name on the deed. And then I probably should have refinanced the house, which at that time I didn't have the income and probably wouldn't have uh, been approved. Um, you know, I mean, I was making like nine or ten dollars an hour working at a at a hotel, and um, uh, you know, as a night auditor because I had to take care of my mom during the day, and um, so I didn't have the income, and frankly, I probably didn't have the credit rating um, to be approved for you know what remained on the um, on the mortgage was like thirty. It's over $30,000, I think, at the time. Um, so so uh, the attorney at the time that I consulted, in fact, a couple of them, 
told me, you know, don't mess with the deed, don't alert the bank, just continue to make the payments every month, and they're not going to question it. And that has indeed been true, you know. I've made the payments every month, and, uh, you know, and I've left the deed alone. But uh, if something happens to me now, uh, everything will come to a head, because now um, my sister-in-law would not be in a position to make the monthly mortgage payment. Um, she's living, you know, basically paycheck to paycheck now. Um, she's still working. If she works, you know, like a full schedule, she doesn't get, you know, her widow's Social Security uh, supplement from, you know, my brother's passing. So she has to work a limited number of hours. And um, together with her income and, and that, and, you know, and they have a daughter that still lives at home. Um, there are times when she's had to, you know, reach out for some financial assistance herself, um, not able to make ends meet uh, all the time. Um, so I guess, you know, my feeling is that, like, if I were to, um, you know, originally my intention was to leave everything to them. They're the only family I've left. But the truth is... Um, my understanding is the bank would step in at that point and say you're either going to refinance this amount or you're going to pay it off or, or we're going to step in and foreclose and within a period of months you know she would lose the house um, because she would not be in a position to do either of those things so my um, alternative is I have a friend Dustin who has been doing really unbelievable um uh, you know, sacrifice in helping me uh, these last couple of years. We, um, you know, um, we've gone on vacations together. Uh, when I was healthier, we used to go, you know, skiing and stuff. We were kind of best friends. And um, he's younger than me. Dustin is, uh, you know, half my age. But um, he's been a very loyal friend and he's kind of someone that I now have been depending on uh, as I go through all of this medical stuff he's basically going to be my primary caretaker um, if I go through with the um, the operation um, he will be taking a leave of absence and um, and staying with me to get me through those first couple of uh, you know weeks or whatever uh, on my own until I'm nurse back to enough health that I can you know be on my own again and um, uh, he has gone with me to every procedure you know he's taken off work uh, moved his schedule around so that he could come and um, be there for everything and like I say uh, in my condition I've needed his help for a number of things that I can no longer do on my own um, so my plan was you know that um you know, was to turn the house over to him because he has some money saved up. And, of course, he lives. Still, he still lives with his dad. His mom tragically just passed away here a few months ago. But um, between him and his dad, they could pay off the loan. Um, and not only that, they could reinvest in the house. They might be able to... There's a number of things that I've not had the money to address um, there's water that comes into the basement. Um, there's some uh, stuff in the kitchen that needs to be um, addressed. Um, there's practically no insulation at all in the attic. Um, so there are, you know, a few thousand dollars at least worth of uh, things that probably should be addressed in the house. And um, they could probably address those things. And then at that point, you know, whether they would want to keep it or Dutt would want to stay here or whether they would want to sell it and, you know, as an investment or whatever. And so I need to see an attorney to see how, you know, I can arrange this. And also how if they do that, if there's some way that we can agree that maybe my sister-in-law and niece should get some portion of that in some way, you know. Um, at any rate, it's a lot to... to um, uh, to consider. Anyway, so that's what's going on here. I am going to end this now because uh, my video is going to stop in a moment because I've reached my limit. I always do. Anyway, thanks for watching. 
I'll see you again real soon.